the days ordained from me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Shalom, Havarim. Hello, friends. It is cold out. I'm going to try that again. It is cold out. <laughs> Some of you got All right. How cold is it? Well, I mean, it's so cold. Like, many of you have had issues with uh, plumbing. I know that we had one day where our pipes froze in our house. Um, schools have closed down simply because of the freezing temperatures. Um, people are having all sorts of issues. You've got to keep your animals indoor. And it's been so cold that even my laptop froze this morning. But I, it's probably partly my fault because I left too many windows open. Oh. All right, so thanks to my friend Don for that joke. Don, if you're watching, they did laugh. So. <laughs> All right, so I don't think of myself as a creative person. You know, I, I see people that are just really gifted artistically, people who can draw and paint. Um, I, I, I have problems with stick figures. <laughs> people can't discern, like, is that a dog? Like, no, that's, that's my family. Um, I can't draw. I can't paint. I'm not overly musical. I don't have the ability to make things out of pottery. Like, I just don't seem to have those traditional gifts. So, so when we talk about people being creative, um, I'm not one person that comes to my own mind. Um, I have surrounded myself, it seems, with creative people. I know really gifted musicians, gifted artists, people that can produce things of great beauty. And it's interesting for me to hang out with these people with their creative mind and knowing how their minds just kind of work differently. But the more time that I spend with people who are creative, the more I realize we have a lot in common. Because even though I'm not artistic and I'm not musical, um, not yeah, all those things that we might value um, traditionally as creative people, even though I don't have those attributes, I realize that a lot of what I do on a Sunday morning in my preparation for preaching, in my, my study, in my re rehearsal, my practice, uh, in my delivery, the way I think about, um, it's not a performance, but how I think about getting up here and sharing the news with you people, I realize just how much my musician friends and I have in common. We get that same rush whenever you get up and speak or whenever you get up and perform in front of somebody. Um, I have the same sense of, of disappointment in myself whenever I don't perform as well as I would like to. And there's a sense of exuberance when things just go well. When that joke actually lands, you know, <laughs> that feeling makes something within me stir. And it's almost like in that moment, I realize that I am doing something that I was made to do. I was born to do just this thing. So in many ways, yes, I don't consider myself a creative person, but I think perhaps we need to expand our understanding of what it means to be a creator, a creative person. Because often we limit it to those very few fine arts kind of things. And those things are great, don't get me wrong. But I think that we are all called to be creators. And I say that with a small c, like not like the creator. Like you are not God. Don't let this go to your head. <laughs> but I do think, as I told the kids, the Bible tells us that we were created in God's image. And God, the creator, is a creative God. God created us in his own image to be creators. So today what we're going to do is we're going to walk through this scripture for, that the kids read for us this morning. We're going to look at some of the details that are in that text and see how God is calling us to move beyond just this image of, of a church that is known by what we can and cannot do, by rules and regulations. Instead, I want to be known as a church that creates, a church that explores, a church that makes things. So if you'll stick with me today, it might be a little bit different. But I think we're going to set kind of a new vision for this church, maybe the church, 
a church of creators, a church of makers, a church of builders, a church of creative people created in the image of God. So let's start by turning to that scripture from the Psalms. Um, This is an interesting passage. I love this passage. There's so much depth, so much metaphor, so much meaning in this text. And it was originally thought to have been written. (laughs) If you read the 11th century Jewish Midrash, one famous rabbi said, this was written by Adam himself. Like this is referring to Adam being built, being formed, being made. This had to have been written by Adam, the first human being. And the reason for this, this rabbi said, is because of verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. And it's this idea that even before we were made, when Adam was just this lifeless lump of clay, God saw Adam in that Of course, the challenge is if you go back a few more verses, you come to verse 13. It says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Why could this not be Adam? He didn't have a mother, (laughs) let alone did his mother have a womb. But let's back up a little bit. Like, This says in our text that this was a psalm written by David. King David composed this psalm. And it says in the heading, I had Hadley read the heading for us as well this morning. It says, for the director of music. Now, it could be that David was writing this. There's two different possibilities. He could have been writing this for a choir director. Or or maybe he wrote it just for you, Curtis. You're our music director today. (laughs) For Curtis. (laughs) Um, But I don't think that's really the case. I think this was meant as a metaphor, that this is a metaphor to describe who God is. And David is envisioning God as this music director. And I really like this metaphor for a couple of reasons. I know many of you have children that have gone through Stanton City Schools, and I know it's not just Stanton City Schools. But in Stanton City Schools, I think when you're like eight years old, one day your kid will show up at home with a recorder. <laughs> yeah, all right, all right, well, we got a recorder at home. Um, and this is like my, my personal like, version of hell. Like, <laughs> I can be a little sensitive to, to sound and music and, and disarray and, and confusion. And all those things come in that one little package that you purchase from. You have to give them a little bit of money, too. Even like you pay for this experience. Um, so the kids come home and they've got this recorder. And I thought about bringing it in for you today. Um, you're welcome. I did not. Um, it's, it's just it's like it's just pandemonium. But if your kids stick with it and they stick with band, you know, let's move up a little bit older. When my kids went into the middle school, each one of them picked up an instrument at school. And you go in and you, you see like which instrument might work best for your kid. And, and one of my kids is playing low brass and the other one's playing woodwinds. And they bring those instruments home the first day. And it's the, it's the whole recorder thing all over again. <laughs> it's, that, that, um, it's lovely, children. It is really lovely. Um, like it's, a, it's a mess. And then they keep playing and they keep practicing. And the beautiful thing is like after three or four months, like they have their first Christmas concert and somebody took all that noise, you know, and like turned that into something beautiful. Like we heard Frosty the Snowman, we heard Ode to Joy played by kids who just a couple months earlier didn't have a clue how to read music, let alone make a decent note on their instrument. And all of that, I give credit to who? I give it credit to the band directors. And I think about this as a metaphor for God. You know, God takes all of these noises, all of these this, this disturbing sounds and these people that are disheveled and all over the place, and God brings them together and makes something harmonious. And we still haven't even got to verse 1 yet of this, this chapter. So David begins. He's like, I am writing this for the great director of music. But I think the real point of this, this passage is both about knowing God and being known by God. So verse 1 says this. This is David speaking to God. He says, you have searched me, Lord, 
and you know me. The first thing that I would have you notice, and it's very easy to skip, is that he uses the second person singular pronoun. Like he's not speaking of some distant deity, like some like, you know, ancient God that he know, doesn't believe any longer exists or, or some God he's never met. Like he's speaking directly to God. When you are speaking to someone, you use the second person singular. I would say, Lowell, you are looking good today in that jacket. If I was speaking to someone else, I would say, he looks good in that jacket. So who is David speaking to? He's speaking directly to God. And not only that, like he uses, you see this word right here, Lord, it's written all in caps. And it's not like David is just angry. <laughs> That's an angry font there. You know, Lord, you have searched me. When you see Lord written all in caps in the Hebrew literature, it's a reference to what we call the tetragrammaton. The tetragrammaton is the holy name for God. It's the name that Hebrew people to this day still won't speak out loud because they believe they have to honor God's name and keep it holy. This is the word that we probably will translate or pronounce as Yahweh today. We don't really know how to say it because the Jewish people won't speak it out loud. If a Jewish person was reading this text, when they got to the word that's, translated, that's written out as Yahweh, they would say Adonai, which simply means Lord. Or sometimes they'll say Hashem, the name. David calls God by name. You remember the first time your best friend called your parents by their first name? Or your kids' friends called you by their first, your first name? Like at first, it's a little bit awkward, isn't it? Like, you should call me Mr. Johnson or Miss Jackson. And, and, and no, like, there's this closeness, this intimacy. David and God, David is speaking directly to God, calls him by name. David knows God, and God knows him. So we go on in this passage, and we see these kind of differing images, these, these opposites. And, and David says, like, you know all about me. Like, as much as I know you, I can call you by name. I can address you directly. You know even more about me. And he gives these opposites. He says, you know when I sit down and when I rise, when I come in and when I go out, um, you know me in darkness, you know me in light. Um, you knew me before I was ever born. You are going to know me long after I'm gone. Now, the thing to remember is this is poetry, so it's, it's meant to be kind of elaborate language here that maybe isn't literal, but yet what we see here is there's nothing about us that God doesn't know. And he makes it very clear that God sees everything that we do. And of course, when you start thinking about God watching all the time and seeing everything you do, what do you mind, what's your mind automatically go to? Does God see me when? <laughs> I just wanted to see what you would say. <laughs> I heard when I sleep, when I'm in the bathroom, is what I assumed. <laughs> and the answer is yes, God sees you in the bathroom, so make sure you wash your hands. <laughs> but that's not the point. The point is, you know God, and God knows you. God knows us even better than we know ourselves. And he has this other metaphor you know, they say, don't mix metaphors, but yet David does. He says in verse 13b, he says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And I love this metaphor because I, I personally, I don't know how to knit. Do we have any knitters out there? Can I get a woo-hoo from the knitters? All right, that's an emphatic group. Knitting is detailed. It's intricate. You look at this person, like they're, they're building something here. They're making something. This scarf, this hat, whatever it is, these different textures, the cables, you have to count the stitches. And I imagine God, you know, up in heaven, knitting together our DNA, the A's, the C's, the T's, and the G's, which I don't remember what they stand for, but I know that those go together. Um, God's up there knitting every part of our body together, knowing the details of who we are. This is our creative God, creator God creating us, knowing each and every detail about our life and being. So there's this interesting passage, and maybe I should use that word loosely. <laughs> interesting to me, passage in the book of Exodus. 
So in this story, um, it's found two different places in Exodus. It's Exodus, um, let's see, I don't have it here. Um, it happens first whenever Moses first goes up the mountain in Exodus. He hears the voice of God. God tells him to tell this guy that he's got a special job to do, that he's going to be building things, making things, preparing things. Moses comes down, and eventually he tells the people what God told him. So we find it those two different times. The second time we find it, it's in chapter 35. And this is what God told Moses to tell the people. So he's specifically speaking about this one guy whose name I didn't include because it's really hard to say. And you'll see why I didn't have the kids read this one. That God has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of artistic crafts. And he has given both him and Aholiab, son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He has filled them with skill to do all kinds of work as engravers, designers, embroiderers in blue and purple, scarlet yarn, and fine linen, and weavers, all of them skilled workers and designers. Now, lifted out of its context, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. But what's going on here is that God is saying, there's all these people among you who are very gifted craftsmen and craftswomen. People who can make, people who can build. And, and these are people who, specifically it says, they're filled with the Spirit of God. Like, this didn't just happen. This is God working through these people. And they're supposed to make these things, build these things for use in the temple, which will be built. At this point, they're making them for the tent of meeting. All of these things. And and they look at it, it's like people who are working with gold and silver and bronze, stone cutters, people who are doing woodworking, making all of these beautiful artistic crafts. Um, One of the things that they're gifted is the, the craft of teaching one another, embroidering, weaving, all of these things. God's saying, you have been gifted to do these things for the glory of the kingdom. And it makes me think, as I said earlier, that sometimes we become so limited in what we think is creative, what we think is artistic, that we tend to to lower other things, like this is a secondary kind of act, or, or less of creation, or less of being a creator, Preaching or teaching or woodworking or cutting stone, these are listed as gifts from God to make this world a more beautiful place. So I'm thinking as people created in the image of God, a creator God, um, who made the heavens and the earth, who built the, the mountains and the sunset, who, who caused the rivers to run and the streams to flow, we, like that God whom in His image we were created, are called to make this world beautiful for God's glory. So I'm... Recently I read a book that I think kind of hits at this. And this is where my kind of visioning for the church kicks in. And I read this book by a guy named um, Shabad Ahmed. He comes from Singapore. His parents were Pakistani. And he taught at schools in the United States. So you can see like, he's, he's from all over the world. Like, he's been all these different places, all these different experiences. He writes about religion. He writes about the theory of religion and asks the question, what makes a religion? And Ahmed calls people to move beyond traditional concepts of religion. I know this is a little abstract. But what he says is too often we have defined religion by what is restrictive and what is prescriptive. That is what you cannot do and that what you must do. Here's his somewhat pretentious words right here (laughs) from Ahmed. He says, traditionally, concepts of prescription, restriction, homogenization, monovalency, orthodoxy, and agreement have habitually and almost universally been given constitutive pride of place in conceptualizations of religion. Right? Uh Uh-huh. Amen. You got that. (laughs) Prescriptive. What does that mean? That means you have to do something. You are prescribed to do something. Restrictive means you cannot do something. You are restricted from doing that. The homogenization, monovalency, orthodoxy agreement, that's all about being of one voice. And he's saying these aren't necessarily bad things. 
But why are they given the position of authority? Or why is that how we define what is a religion? And if you think about it, what has defined the Mennonite church? We talk about the things that we can do or must do and cannot do. Mennonites are people who do not go to war. Mennonites are people who must live simply. Mennonites are people who must serve one another, who must forgive one another. Now, just, just be honest, like those, those are not bad things, right? <laughs> That's good to serve one another. That's good to forgive one another. He's not saying, stop doing those things. But he's saying, why do we define ourselves by what we don't do and what we must do? Instead, he gives us two different categories. He says, what if we were known as people of the explorative and creative nature? Like, what if we were known by what we make and what we can produce rather than what we cannot do or must do? do. So I started thinking, you know, I was starting applying this to the scripture for today. And the first thought is like, this is just weird. Like, like why would we be known by the things that we make, the things that we produce or being creative people? But looking back at the Bible, how much of what is in the Bible is about what people were doing or making or creating? Entire books of the Bible are based on the creative enterprise of God's people. The book of Psalms, that's a book of songs. <laughs> like it was just written so that it could be set to music and sung by God's people in a place of worship. There's another book in the Bible called the Song of Solomon. Like this is creative writing and, and it's either meant to be a song to God or maybe even an allegory about God's relationship to the church. Either way, like read the Song of Solomon and it's like it's really creative. Um, young men, if you really want to know about how to talk to a woman, read the Song of Solomon. <laughs> Your hair is like the goats as they descend from the mountain. <laughs> you feel it, right? <laughs> Makes your heart go pitter-patter. And I'm not just making that up. Read the book. <laughs> um, where was I? You look at these stories from the Bible. There's so many times when people are celebrating and they do what? They sing. When Mary finds out she's pregnant, she sings. Many characters in the Bible, as they cross the Red Sea, they sing these songs. It's about creating, it's about exploring, asking what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus. Now, neither Ahmed or I am saying let's do away with all the prescriptive and restrictive side, restrictive side of religion. Um, and I'm not saying that we need to stop believing that Jesus is Lord. Like, don't think I'm going that direction. But can we be known by what we make, what we create, what we build, what we explore? And throughout history, Christianity has been known for some of the greatest pieces of artwork in history. For instance, here is a reproduction of da Vinci's Last Supper. I probably didn't need to tell you that. You knew this one. Um, we've got things like Michelangelo's David, who I intentionally cropped from the waist up. <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous piece of work. We look at some of the medieval and later like um, musicians. We have people like Beethoven and Bach who wrote large pieces for the church. Handel's Messiah. Like, that is meant to be Christian music, creative and explorative. And even things like architecture at one time. Um, this is the, the Notre Dame Cathedral in France. You look at the beauty of this. Someone created this for the glory of God. So my question for us today is, what do these things say about our belief system? What does it say about our theology? The beautiful things that we create, what does it say about what we believe about God? So I got a little bit closer to home. I started thinking about some of the things that people in this congregation have made. And I turned to some thoughts about the relief sale. And I thought about some of the things that you all have submitted to that place as well. Um, I won't say who made what, <laughs> um, although somebody's not here today, so I can point out that she made this, um, this fire ring. I'm like, that's gorgeous. Um, this cousin of this one is out in our hallway. And maybe you can see this coffee table, the outline of the glass top. Um, all these things were things that people in our church made with the skills, the gifts that God gave to them. So what does it mean? What's the theology of these things? Well, I think we can go a number of ways with it, but I would say each one of these things were donated with the labor of love from these people in this church so that that money could go to help other people as well. 
Each piece tells a story. And I started thinking more like, well, yes, music and, and woodworking, um, cutting things out of metal. Um, these are all very Mennonite art, artistic forms. But what would be the, the cream of the crop, the top level? If we think about Mennonite art forms, what would it be? I was going with the one I heard back here about quilt making. Yeah. Here's the thing about quilts. If you've never been a part of the process, um, maybe modern quilts are made a little bit differently. But just think about how quilts are assembled. First, somebody has a bunch of old scraps. You start with material that maybe you, you made a shirt or some pants out of, um, but you have extra material left over afterward. And most people would do what? With extra material, you throw it out. Not the Mennonites. <laughs> Because there's a chance we might use it one day. The person is acquiring all of these different scraps and pieces of material. And in that process, they're starting to think about a vision for what that could become. And they start sharing that vision with other people as well, with friends, with people from church. And one day they sit down and they start bonding one piece to the next. And after many, many hours and a lot of hard work, Something that could have been easily thrown away and just kind of disposed of becomes something of great value, of great beauty, and very useful, especially on cold winter days. Now, I think we can use that and ask the question, what theology is there in a quilt? Use it as a metaphor for the church. We are made up of a bunch of raggedy old people. People that sometimes the world would say have no value. Just throw out, get rid of. But somebody, some being had a vision for those individuals and they joined them all together. And the more you get together, the more you bond one to another, the more strong and beautiful they become. I believe that we as a church could move from focusing on the prescriptive and the restrictive to focus more on the creative and the explorative not that we forget about all those things, not that we put aside those good things like, like, not, like uh, um, nonconformity and living simple, um, not that we forget about those things, but what if we were known, about, known by the things that we make and asking the question, how does that speak into what we believe? We were created in the image of a creator God to be creators, and I think there's something there to be explored. Please join me in prayer. God, on this Sunday, we, we come together on this cold day and we realize that we are about the same as a quilt. A bunch of people gathered together from different backgrounds, different pieces of cloth, bonded together around one central message about the love of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we go into 2024 a little bit deeper, may we consider ways that you are calling us to be creators creative people, created in your image. And help us, Lord, to ask the questions about what that means to the watching world. Help us, Lord, to be more like you each and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, well, this brings us to the portion of our...